We're back here at Pulse 89.9 FM and of course it's in topic and it's Monday morning and it's the beginning of the week and I'm very fortunate to have in the studio this week and today Nathan Semprog. Now how are you Nathan? I'm very well thank you Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes I'm glad you took me up on my offer. I did an offer to all of the councillors uh, to come on to Pulse and to have a chat to us so that the community of the Hawkesbury can get to know who their councillors are, what's going on and how, you know, if they've got a question, they can ask that question and know how approachable you all are. Um, look, Nathan, I'd like to sort of jump into something that was a bit of a hot topic because of the recent floods and I'd like to go into the problems around the floods is, of course, the building of the dam wall always comes up we then look at the development of the uh, area of the Hawkesbury and the infrastructure of our drains. That's a huge subject. We may only get that in today, but I'd like to jump onto that because where do we go? I mean, what I know that this is a state level, this damn wall, but I know that the council would have to have some input into that. Um, this is one of the reasons that people get so frustrated about it. I'm glad that you've started with an easy question rather than a hard one. No, it is the it is the intractable problem. These uh, problems involve multiple agencies. They involve both council, uh, local government, state government, even federal government. Um, drainage, particularly, seems to be in the council's portfolio. And one of the things that we learned after a number of floods in 2021 and 2022 uh, was that we needed to do an audit of our drainage network. Yeah. When council went out to examine the state of many of these drains for the first time in forever, we couldn't even find some of these drains. Mm. They'd been silted in, they'd been ploughed over, they'd been, you know, moved in the affliction of time and they weren't fit for purpose. Mm. So when we have a massive rainfall event on the floodplain, the one thing that we can't have is any impediments for the egress of that water to then make its way back to the creeks and tributaries mm. into the river. Yes. And, uh, you know, prolong the severity uh, of a flood event. And I suppose that that's a lead into what the state government's now proposing, because since the state government have effectively shelved the idea of raising Warragamba Dam, they made some vague gesture towards other methods for flood mitigation. And the yes. only thing that they could come up with was levees. Well, levees prevent floodwaters from getting into your property up to a certain point. But once the water rises above that levee, it also impedes the water from leaving afterwards. And the reason that the council has made such a noise about this is because the state government have been in power for more than a year and haven't even as much as visited us to have the discussion about what flood mitigation measures they are going to support, given that they're not going to raise Warragamba Dam, which remains, in my opinion, the one thing that would do the most to limit the severity and frequency of bad floods. So you don't think by raising the dam wall that that could open up the doorway to more property development, which is one of the things that's been a concern? No, look, I've heard both of these arguments. Let me deal with them in turn. Yep. Firstly, concerning development, when the previous state government were mooting this, they said there will be no change to the flood height controls for development. Mm. So they said as explicitly as they could, and not merely the ministers and politicians, mm. but the public officials and the engineers and the scientists that were seconded to try and draw up this comprehensive plan, they said it would be foolish. We concede completely that it would be perverse to raise the dam only then to permit extra development on the floodplain. It's an argument that's levied by people that have other reasons for opposing raising Warragamba Dam. Maybe they have sincerely held, in my opinion, misguided concerns about Aboriginal uh, culture or the environment and so forth. Um, and then they throw in this scare about development. There isn't a single square inch of land that's currently sterilised for development that would become unlocked in the event of Warragamba Dam being raised. The flood height controls would stay where they are. Do you know, I hear what you're saying, and I have heard that argument over the years that we've been stricken by the floods and I think what people get concerned with Nathan is the fact that what is said now may not be what happens in five ten years time I mean we had the recent uh, incident that happened in the local area where the Wilcox property now the road was going to go through 
their property and wipe them out. And yet we had vacant, not vacant, I know it was owned by someone beside mm -hmm. beside that. And apparently that there was a, a written uh, comment in all the findings that came out that that property next door wasn't to be touched. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the reason I bring that up is that if someone has to fight so hard and that there's an underlying cause of someone saying, don't ever touch this other property, how do we know that can't happen again on something oh. as massive? And think about it. How much money is in there with developments and the sway that money has? Well, let, let, you, you've mentioned a lot there. Let me start by saying that we're switching a lot between things that are well above the pay grade of a local councillor. So right. whether we raise war again, but damn, and what certain mitigation measures are a question for the state government. Yes. I'm happy to put my two cents worth in. Yep. I'm here as an individual first, as a councillor second, and I don't speak for council. And every time I give an interview, I have to give, give that caveat. Secondly, let's set the scene for listeners. When the Red Bank development was approved at North yep. Brisbane, the developers came to council and said, as a sweetener, we will put money into a pot and we will build a brand new bridge across the Gross River yes. to connect North Richmond with uh, Hawkesbury Road up towards Springwood and the bridge will go in somewhere around Navua Reserve. Yes. That money's been accumulating in the developer's bank account ever since. The developer is on the hook for the cost of building that bridge regardless of how much it costs. Yep. There's been grumbling at times about that, but I'd, I'd say that there's been generally a commitment to get that done. Yeah. It's just that it's dragged its heels. Mm. The developers, under the terms of the original VPA, the Voluntary Planning Agreement, should have had the bridge built by now. There should be cars operating on that bridge right now. And you might have observed that there isn't a single shovel in the ground yet. Yes. Because the developers asked for delay, 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 delay. Council then shares some of the blame by saying halfway through this process, well, we don't want the bridge near Navua Reserve. We want to change completely where that bridge is going to go. Right. The approach road for the new bridge was supposed to sweep through uh, the area around Ashton's Road and then cross the river and connect with Hawkesbury Road. And it took out a complete farm and their home. And it, it seemed to people like me that this was perverse because there was vacant land, that's to say land that didn't have a house on it, yes. on either side. Why choose the, the one route that would actually demolish somebody's yes. house? I mean, it was like that movie, The Castle. Yeah. And the Wilcox family were in a state of considerable and understandable distress. Hmm. And in the chamber, I argued that we could re-examine the route. And what's telling to me is the people that said that this was completely impossible and that the route had been selected and that it was a fait accompli, I managed to get it through the chamber to have the route re-examined and then lo and behold, an equivalent route that that um, that was perfectly suitable was found so that it skirted around the Wilcox property, just nicks it, leaves the house intact. And the and I, I have to confine myself to what's on the public record, council uh, engaged a consultant at some expense to try and get to the bottom of why an adjacent property was allegedly taken off the table. That investigation in my opinion, proved to be extremely unsatisfactory and got nowhere and found no conclusions because the relevant people that could have spoken to that refused to participate and the consultant had no power to, um, you know, coerce or, or, or have documents or emails or correspondence produced. So it's left where it is. I think that's taken a dent um, out of the people's trust in council because things should be open and explicable transparency. And, and, and transparent and this was neither mm. every couple of years council does a survey about the things that people value the most and unsurprisingly the number one concern is the state of roads yes number two is the preservation of our rural heritage and amenity and the way that we live and that we don't want to become an ant nest like we see down windsor road yes which is a subject that i'm particularly passionate about uh, and the third is that our government is transparent accountable and has integrity. So, you know, I've tried in my eight years on council to bring in initiatives that, that foster that sense of mm -hmm. participation and accountability. Mm -hmm. um, I passed a motion in the council that at the end of every council term, every councillor's attendance at meetings and also briefings and workshops and things that are less visible, but just as important in painting the picture of how diligent a councillor is, 
be reported back to the, the chamber. I got it through the chamber, and then within a couple of months, the major party bloc, and I mean the Liberal and Labor parties working together, voted to rescind that, which meant that as far as the official council policy is concerned, a lot of the information that voters might use to make an informed judgment about whether their councillors have done a good job wouldn't be published. I'm glad to see that other people are taking up that mantle and are taking it upon themselves to try and collate and present that information to the community, and I thoroughly endorse it. They got the idea from that. Yeah. We might just pop off to a couple of sponsors and uh, be back shortly. Welcome back, everyone, to In Topic on Monday morning on Pulse 89.9. I have in the studio with me Nathan Samprognio, councillor for the Hawkesbury City Council, and uh, we've been chatting about, oh, actually, very interesting, the dam, which is a state issue, and I do acknowledge that too. But also the way that the council and the transparency, which also brought in the uh, Wilcox property, one of the things you talked about in that was the state of the roads as well, which is on my list to talk to you, because I think sometimes with the roads, Nathan, that people and, like, we see they're in the electorate or in the Hawkesbury area, but not all of them are the responsibility of the actual council. And I think sometimes that's where it gets difficult. It is. So there are, there are multiple kinds of roads. And when somebody drives over a pothole and dings the rim on their car, people don't particularly try and think through who should be to, to, to blame. Generally, people blame council. But we have state roads. We have council roads. There are crown roads. Yeah. Uh, I don't believe we have any federal roads uh, in our LGA, but um, people just want stuff to be fixed. Now, the simple fact of the matter is that we are caught between two stools. Hawkesbury is classified as a metropolitan council, mm -hmm. but we have a vast area. Our area is many, many multiples of other uh, council areas, and therefore the length of roads that we have to maintain is significantly mm. larger. Thousands of kilometres of yeah. sealed and unsealed roads. Mm. And after we had massive, multiple flood events in 2021, 2022, and again, just recently, um, it left our roads in a shopping stop. Yeah. And it is a sad but true fact that the revenue that council gets and then the grants that council gets from other tiers of government are simply not adequate. We are, we are moving towards a situation where we're going to have an entrenched infrastructure backlog. In other words, the... Ma the maintenance of roads will need to be um, kicked up to kind of keep assets at their current level. If we don't have the money to do that, then those assets will degrade and they're kind of given an A to F rating and if they're kind of down around D, E and F, they're full of potholes. That's why people get really, really uh, cranky about it. In the 2022-23 year, we've spent uh, about $11 million on road maintenance. Compare that to when I started in council eight years ago, when we were spending about $5 million. So what we've spent annually has more than doubled. And in the 2023-24 year, it's, down, it's around about $10 million. So we have millions of dollars of road maintenance projects in the pipeline, but the difficulty has been labour, bitumen, concrete, aggregate, stuff like that, and simply getting uh, contractors that are qualified to do the job to get it done. And then that leads to the next criticism that people have because people see a road crew arrive in their area and then the road is fixed, but a substandard job is done. And then in six months, they've got to kind of do it again. It's like somebody yeah. kind of came out with a shovel full of hot licks and then, you know, gave That's it a pack, jumped yeah. up and down on it for two seconds and then left. Yeah. So there are some there are some intractable issues about the way we manage our road projects, the, the simply the, the scale of road projects. The fact that when the when other tiers of government give council money, often we don't have any additional money for what's called project management. We're paid for capital, yep. and then we've got to manage it out of our own pocket. So we've got to draw increasingly on our own resource and spend money that we would have spent on other projects like maintaining you know, parks and libraries and pools and stuff like that to then uh, equip the funds uh, in a way that you know honours that money that we've been given mm -hmm. and can do a good job. We're getting better at it. Certainly, we understand acutely that when we survey people, this is their number one issue and by a long margin. And any councillor, if they want to get elected or re-elected in September, will have to say, we hear you. We're not about 
social engineering or pet projects or things like that. We're about focusing on the basics, which includes, first and foremost, fixing the roads. So what would you do? What would I do? Yeah. Well, I mean, we need to advocate for a, a, a bigger slice of the pie. Yeah. The fact that Hawkesbury Council is de- deemed to be a metropolitan council gives us access to a certain pool of funds. funds. Whereas for many other things, in practice, we are a rural oh, yeah. council yeah. because of the length of roads that we have to maintain, which means that we don't become eligible for pots of money that would otherwise be eligible. Mm. We need to argue for a, a fairer share of, say, federal money, what are called federal assistance grants. Yeah. Back in about 1995, grants from federal governments accounted for 1% of all taxation revenue. Right. And now it's at less than half of a percent. In other words, the quantum of money, never mind the dollar value, grows with the economy, yeah. but the percentage that we get from the federal government is effectively halved over the last 30 years. And we are the subject of massive cost shifting from other tiers of government, like the state government places regulatory and administrative burdens on local governments, not just Hawkesbury, yeah. but all local governments. I go to conferences where this is the, the one thing we talk about year after year. And we are required to, I mean, uh, I'll give you an example. We are, we pay a tax to the state government for collecting Hawkesbury people's rubbish and putting it into our, into our own dump. I mean, we're fortunate as a council that we have our own dump. Think of other councils that don't have enough land area to have a waste deposit facility. We do. We've got a hole and we stick the waste in it. We have to pay a massive tax to the state government for collecting our own waste and putting it in our own facility. And we don't get nearly that money back, uh, you know, in in, in waste management or or in other projects. So what does it take to write that? Well, what it, 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 it takes being more assertive as a sector and individually as a council. I note that my major party colleagues, the Liberal and the Labor Party, have and will again advance an argument that it's good to have Labor councillors and Liberal councillors in local government because they can work closely with the government of the day, whether it's Labor or Liberal, to get outcomes. But if the last eight years have proven anything to me, is that that's a fiction. We have a Liberal state member and we have a Labor federal member who are at times, despite their sincere best offices, are unable to get the result from other tiers of government. Think of the Pitt Town Bypass. The Pitt Town Bypass was, has been promised since the 1940s and it hasn't been built. Think about the promises that were made after the last floods in 2022 to give expedited permission to cut the red tape so that landowners down alongside the river can do the remediation they need to save their home structures and livelihoods. Two or three years on, these landowners are still waiting for the permission to do the work. And they've attended meetings and I've heard them say it would be easier and cheaper to do this work illegally, to cop the fine and pay the fine than to wait on the state government to give us the requisite permissions to cut that red tape, to get stuff done. Um, When the flood came, a couple of weekends ago, Transport for New South Wales, the relevant state agency, didn't lay down the railing yes, on the bridge. Yes. So all of that debris that had dead trees that had died in the previous floods yes. up around Yarramundi, Yarramundi, the confluence of the Gross River, were ready to be uprooted. They became uprooted. They came downstream. What was the next impediment? North Richmond Bridge. Yep. After the last floods, those railings were completely replaced with brand new railings. Yes. And yet the railings weren't laid down. Why? I don't know. And I'm saying give local councils the funding and the authority that they need to get the job done. Let us put the railings down because we'll be there when we need to, to lay them down. There's a, there are, there's a flood evacuation route in Pitt Town. Yes. Not just old Pitt Town Road, which yeah. badly needs an upgrade, but there's an emergency route that cuts through the National Park. Yep. There are gates at either end of that and it's only opened in times of emergency. At some point over the last several years, the locks on the gates were changed and the local RFS haven't been given the keys to those gates. See, it's disgusting. But it it, it speaks to this malaise. We can't rely on other tiers of government to do this for us. Council can get the job done if we're given the money and authority to do so. So a question, you talked about something which I think a lot of people actually, I've heard grumbling about 
um, in from the community is when you talk about council, from the old-fashioned council was people that you elected in your community that you thought could speak for that micro community within the large community. Mm-hmm. It, it, if I think that's <clears throat> my lay way of looking at it. And yet then there wasn't politics in it. And now it seems to be that the politics has been dragged into the council where you do have your different political I, spheres. I, I did a little tally. You'd have to go back to about 1995 to find a chamber that had no party political representation. I mean, but you might have. What had, do you think? Do you, you think you, you, might have, you might have had people who were a member of a party but weren't elected standing under that banner? Yeah. Now, as of the last council election, there were nine. Count it. Nine out of twelve uh, elected representatives that had a party political affiliation. And hand on heart, I used to be one of them. Mm-hmm. I was a member of the Liberal Party for thirty years. I'm now proudly an independent. I've had far more praise since I parted ways with a major party and stood as an independent. I said, I've got my own story to tell. And, you know, I'm tired of people being elected to council on the coattails of a brand where those people may not have any particular cachet with the community. It's the brand that they're standing under. And they'd never be elected in a million years under their own steam. I would prefer to see a council of 12 good citizens who have proven their ability to engage with the community because of their associations with sporting clubs and service associations Mm. and emergency services and who are teachers and who are coaches and who are volunteers with Rotary and Lions and stuff like that. I want to see good people on council and I'm overt in stating that my intention uh, at, at the coming elections is to have independence control the chamber and I think that would result in better and more accountable government for the Hawkesbury. Transparency. And more transparency as well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, with the council elections coming up, now uh, there's something that obviously people will start, there'll be movement around people wanting to go for positions on council and who will retire, who won't. When do they have to actually, when do you put your hand up? All right then. So um, the Electoral Commission Mm. will close nominations at some point in August. Okay. Probably about a month before the poll itself. And that gives them time to ratify the paperwork and print the ballot paper. Yeah. People that want to stand under a party political banner have to then, prior to that, work within whatever process their party has set up. So, for example, the Liberal Party's uh, pre-selection timetable closes tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And even after tomorrow, it may take some time to work out who will be standing for the Liberal Party. I hear that some councillors are retiring. I won't speak for them. I can only speak for myself. I am standing. Um, I hear stories in the paper of other councillors retiring, but ask them. Yep. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I I intend to. Mm-hmm. And hence why I wrote to all councillors to offer that opportunity to speak here. Um, with the uh, council election coming up, though, um, how many spots are there in council? So there are 12 spots. Right. And what areas do they represent? Well, curiously, we... We're an unusual council in that we don't have wards. Okay. All councillors represent the whole of the Hawkesbury, all the wow. way up to Hilton, all the way out to St Albans. Wow. And, and the, the more densely populated areas around Windsor and, yeah. and so forth. And different parts of our district have different characters. You know, you've got the very rural feel up in the mountains and in the McDonald Valley. You've got areas that are subject to some fairly intensive development pressure around the southeast, around Oakville, Vineyard and Moralia. We actually had a referendum in 2016 about whether we should introduce wards. In other words, break up the council area Mm. and have um, councillors that just represent one patch. Mm. That was voted down fairly strongly. I think people like the idea that all of their councillors have to represent the whole area rather than confining their advocacy to just one small quarter of the district. We are united. I, I rather like that. Even though it makes the job of being a councillor and a candidate much harder because I've got to get to every everywhere of our area and yeah. I do that as often as I can. Yeah, yeah. And I, I like it too, Nathan, because uh, when you have particular wards, if someone's in and someone isn't, people get worried about, oh, that ward's getting more preferential treatment than this ward, whereas when you look after all, it is all, isn't it? It's encompassing the Well, whole. I mean, people still worry about that and I, I break down the numbers in, in a variety of ways. People in a suburb that's subject to acute development pressure, like Oakville, which is where I'm from, family grew up in Oakville, 
and I went to work for public school, sent my son there and all the rest of it. They take in, and I can't remember what the figure was, but I had it at my fingertips at one point, but let's say they, they take in, they account for 10% of the Hawkesbury's population, but yep. but account for 20% of the Hawkesbury Council's revenue. Yep. So they're paying a disproportionate share and don't seem to see much of that money back. And and I'm sure a similar argument could be make, made for many other areas, be it Bowen Mountain yep. or, or, or Agnes Banks yep. or, or Hobartville, people feel that they're not getting value out of council and that their area is, is, is neglected in some way. And that's simply a function of the fact that council is so strapped and that this is going to become increasingly acute. And if you ask me to make a prediction, I suspect that there will be another request for a special rate variation to hike everybody's rates at some point in the coming years I think council staff are trying to soften us up for that. Yeah. It's not official. Yeah. And my interest overwhelmingly is in ensuring that people are engaged because on the one hand, people are, might legitimately say, you're not doing a good job with the money we've given you. Mm. You you pledged to do certain things with the last rate hike mm. that you haven't done. And a good example would be Sealing Packer Road. And we came to within a breath of reneging on a promise that was linked to the last rate rise yeah. about sealing Packer Road. Thankfully now, we got that through the chamber and Packer Road is going to be sealed. Yeah. If we asked for another rate rise, the community's trust might be low. Mm. But on the other hand, if you phrase your question rightly and you say, we understand that you value the quality and maintenance of our infrastructure, including our roads, would you be prepared to pay more if it meant a... Uh, and if the argument was put, if the, if the numbers were there... I think a lot of people are very open to that idea, but they have to trust that council will execute. That's right. And I've always said as a maxim, competence trumps any kind of ideology. You have to be able to govern well and manage well because council and the 12 councillors manage an annual budget of about $100 million. And, you know, you're on a learning curve when you become a councillor and you've got to learn, uh, firstly, not to have the wall pulled over your eyes. Mm. Secondly, to equip council's budget properly mm. to make sure that we're not gold plating things unnecessarily and wasting money on stuff. So for example, there's some um, there's a bog along Pitt Town Road right now and we've pledged a hundred thousand dollars to just clear up this this small boggy area and everyone's aghast and they're saying it's not as though we didn't want this done. We're just aghast that it could cost a hundred thousand yes. dollars yes. to get a you know bobcat in there and to kind of and correct, that's what correct, people see. Correct the problems with the drainage. Yes. Um, you know, council spends tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on litigation. That includes code of conduct complaints that councillors make against other councillors and litigation where somebody disagrees with a council a decision that council makes and then it ends up in the land and environment court. Hmm. And, you know, one of the things that surprised me when we're briefed regularly about this is just how much money we spend defending matters because somebody disagreed and sometimes those litigants win against council. Sometimes yep. we win. There's a balance there. Yep. But I mean, these are all things where I think the the vote, the, the, the right paying public expect that we've got our hands on the tiller. Because if you had a managerial perception of, of local government, you could say, why have an elected chamber at all? Mm. Let the general manager and their staff manage it. Well, that's what I was going to ask next. We have an elected chamber and we've already had so many of our powers taken away from us. Yes. Only seven years ago, council as a chamber sat in on every DA and voted on every DA. Now that's been devolved out to planning panels where you have people that might have subject matter expertise in, in planning, but if they make a decision that people don't agree with, they have no skin in the game. They don't necessarily even live in the area and they have no democratic accountability. You can't take them to task at the ballot box for making a wrong decision, when we make a decision, we're accountable at the ballot box, and that's the way it should be. So what decisions does councillors make? What do they help in? Well, What, the, what are they there for? for the, the, the state government say that we are now there to set policy. Right. And there's a lot of work to be done in setting good policy. We need to get our local environmental plan through. Our LEP and our DCP are our two key planning documents. They define what zones what land, you know, how big your block can be, what yeah. kind of structures you're at. Is it commercial? Is it industrial? Is it residential? Um, 
the the form and fabric. You're allowed to make things with these fabrics, but not these fabrics. You know, steel and tin and brick yeah. and so forth, so that it looks pleasant. Is that it's built to an appropriate standard yeah. in terms of energy efficiency, environmental friendliness. Um, that you know, um, developments are properly serviced with um, uh, transport and sewerage and water and yes. and, and yes. 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 and street lamps and street furniture and all of this. Yes. And um, we're, we're falling down on the job there as well. At the end of the last term of council, so we're saying three years ago now, <clears throat> one of the dying gasps of the previous chamber was to finalise the structure of our LEP and then send it off to what's called gateway, which means that we send it to the state government who dot the I's and cross the T's and send it back and it becomes our active document. We badly need a new LEP. Our current LEP uh, dates from about 2012, which means that it's now over a decade old and it's no longer fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. Our new LEP has all kinds of goodies like incentives for and you know zoning categories for ecotourism, for detached dual occupancies and granny flats and secondary dwellings. Which so every, much needed. Which everybody says is a wonderful idea. Yes. I've been a, a huge uh, advocate for uh, granny flats and secondary dwellings yes. because of the social benefits. It lets parents give a leg up to their kids mm. so that they can continue to live in the communities that they grew up in without yes. having to move away to whoop whoop and losing those social connections. It allows people to continue to house their parents yes. with a degree of independence and dignity yes. uh, on the same on the family property. Mm -hmm. um, this is the way that my family lived. My family at Oakville have an attached dual occupancy mm -hmm. where mum and dad, you know, live next door uh, and you know the kids run around in the yard with the chasing the dog with the ball and, and it's it's a great way to live. You can have a detached you you can have a granny flat in a tiny little block in Hobartville or Bly Park, but you can't have a granny flat in Oakville or Corrigan, we'll see. Now that's acres. crazy, isn't it's it? It's crazy. So, we had our LEP ready to enact at the end of the last term. The mm. new chamber are seated, and the very, very first thing that they do is pull it back. And I likened it to launching a boat and then belatedly trying to pull it back up onto the blocks. So why was because they wanted to get their fingers on, on it? They wanted to get their fingerprints on it and and then make up reasons like oh we haven't consulted with the reference group and we haven't. So know, when we're talking about this, which means that we're now at the end of this council term and we still don't have a new LEP. But hang on, what about the waste of money? If you're consulting everywhere, left, right, and centre, that's costing money all the time, isn't it? Well, I mean, you know, every policy should be the subject of public consultation. But you've already done this LEP, haven't you? Well, we've done a lot of public consultation, and I thought that we were ready to go, and we mm. pulled back up onto the blocks, and there's been further delays, some of which were caused by council, some of which were caused by the state government, you know, once it was back in their court, yep. twiddling their thumbs and, you know, taking their sweet time to kind of come back to us with a final form. I still have some hopes that we can enact a new LEP during this council term. So you haven't got much time. It would be a massive abrogation of our responsibility for the chamber to have... I mean, I didn't vote to delay this. Other people voted to delay yeah. this. You can ask them. But, um, you know, we're now three years on and we could have had the, act, the active document running now mm. and people speculate about why people wanted it to be delayed I won't go. We'll talk to people and maybe we might get one of the <clears throat> councillors that may that went against that Ellie. No, they're, and... they're the ones that don't want to talk to you, Catherine. <laughs> I got people that don't want to talk to me, Nathan. I didn't know that. Right, oh well, that's have, interesting. People would have declined your kind invitation. Oh well, I actually haven't had a decline. I've just haven't had a response. So I, I will say that I have had uh, a few responses and I will be talking uh, to Eddie and I will be talking to Let's. So I'm happy to be here. And if I've become known for anything in my eight years on councillors, the only councillor that has a YouTube channel, I'm the only councillor that runs a website. I've now got 94,000 words that I've written on local issues on my website. I engage with people. I run petitions and surveys. I've got a new initiative now called futureofthehawksbury.com where people can go and participate in a range of petitions and surveys about a variety of issues so that I can gauge where the strength of support is mm -hmm. for, you know, preserving our semi-rural amenity, stopping the urban sprawl, mm -hmm. sealing various roads around the district, what they think about council's role in local child care. We have mm -hmm. a number of different preschools in the area. There are nine sites that run on council land to which we charge peppercorn rents, mm -hmm. ostensibly with the objective of 
subsidising childcare, that's an appropriate thing for council to do. Yeah. The survey responses that I've received have said overwhelmingly that that's a, a virtuous thing for council yeah. to spend some money on. Yeah. <clears throat> but we have to know that we're getting money out of that, yes. getting value out of that. Yes. In the sense that for those ones that are operating on council facilities where there's an opportunity cost to us because we're not charging commercial rents, we want to see proof that those childcare fees are genuinely lower. Yes. And I think the figures and giving do, opportunities I think for the figures people. do do show yeah. that. And I'm mm. very proud of our council mm. owned but independently run facilities. Do you know you you've put me into a subject I'd like to go into, but I don't think we have time today. And I, I probably will uh hopefully have you back if you've got time and uh we talk about a few other subjects that I've got. Um but I've I've enjoyed speaking with you, Nathan. I actually like um, your transparency is what I really like. And I think that the Hawkesbury needs to know things of what's going on with roads. They need to know what's happening with the LEP that you speak of. The people I've spoken to have said, why can't I do a granny flat? This is just ridiculous, you know. Really? And as you say, you can put one in a little backyard, but you've got a couple acres and no, you can't, and yet someone else down the road can that's got small it's just ludicrous and when we've got such a housing shortage these days it seems a no-brainer to do that but even as you speak of our older community you know to be able to have your parents there and the respect mm -hmm. it, it's it there's so many positives on that i would defy anyone to show me the negatives i know and and what vexes people like me is how skewed the debate is so, mm. for example, there is no denying that we are in the middle of a housing crisis. Yep. Housing is so unaffordable, whether you're trying to buy or rent. Yep. And it has so many negative consequences. Financial stress, young people moving away from the areas that they grew up in and felt an affinity for, moving away from the benefits of family support. Or yep. And everybody talks about the supply side. Well, we need to build more houses. We need to lower the cost of housing. Mm. We need to expedite developments with fewer environmental controls or whatever it happens to be. The elephant in the room is that 98%, I'll repeat that number, 98% of the demand for new housing is driven by overseas migration. Yes. 98% yes. in the state yes. of New South Wales, and I suspect in Sydney, it's even higher than that. Yep. Skilled migration has to be a part of Australia's future. Yeah. But we took in over 600 and something thousand people mm. in the 12 months to March. Mm. And that's too many, especially mm. when most of them feel a draw to settle in our major cities. Yeah. Our infrastructure is buckling and the federal government sits on its hands and does nothing because they say that migration and these stresses are the price we pay for stimulus to the rest of the economy. It's the price that we pay to ensure that we maintain the right ratio yeah. between young, able-bodied, tax-paying Australians and older Australians that draw on the social safety net rather than contributing to it. Mm. And these are real problems. But the argument that I've made consistently is that if there are winners and losers in national debates like this, most of the losers seem to be concentrated mm. in the peri-urban fringe around our major cities yeah. like See, like oh, right so, here. Yeah. And unless we have federal representatives, and I call on our federal representative to stand up in parliament and to say, our people are, are, are in real distress. Let's cut back migration until we can find ways of incentivizing people to settle outside the major cities. Yeah. Let's cut migration until we've ensured that housing becomes affordable for the people that already live here. Infrastructure. Nobody's, nobody's doing that. No, but what about infrastructure? How about I remember when Bob Carr, more than 20 years ago, Bob Carr, who was a Labor Premier, mm. so on the opposite side of the political spectrum to me, mm. he was brave enough to stand up and say that Sydney was full. Mm. Clearly, his colleagues in the current state Labor government don't share that assessment mm. because they're trying to find ways of having six and eight storey flat tenements within, within every major population centre, including a number of population centres that have been earmarked in the Hawkesbury yep. and within 800 metres of every train station and there are five train stations. Yep. So you think of, you know, six and eight storey tenements in Richmond, in Windsor, around Bulgrave, around Vineyard, around East Richmond. That's just ridiculous. We can't sustain po population like that and it would ruin all of the reasons that make the Hawkesbury such a wonderful place exactly to live. Right. 
the state government's popul uh, popular, uh, uh, planning policy is unsustainable and it deserves to go away and die in a corner. In the meantime, all we can do, and we have resolved as a chamber, my colleagues are firm with me on this, about saying we oppose this. We, we yeah. can't have this. There are so many other constraints. Yeah. Flood, flood evacuation, oh, yeah. fire, yeah. social cohesion and otherwise. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Mm, that'll be an interesting one, that will be. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate you being here today. Catherine, it's a great pleasure. Happy to come back anytime. Thank you. And, of course, you've been listening to Nathan Saprognia and you've been on Pulse 89.9. We go on with a little bit more music here.